right. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. I know it's a busy time across the university with exams and, and finals and all of that, so I appreciate you joining us. Um, we're really excited for this penultimate installment of our fall speaker series. Um, we're lucky to be joined by Talia Stroud and Josh Tucker, who are the co-chairs of the external academic team on the US 2020 Facebook and Instagram election study. Um, Talia is also a professor in the Department of Communication Studies and the School of Journalism and Media at UC Austin. Uh, and the founding and current director of the Center for Media Engagement and a co-director at New Public. Uh, and Josh is a professor of politics, affiliate professor of Russian and Slavic studies, and affiliated professor of data science at NYU. Uh, he's the director of their Jordan Center for Advanced Study of Russia and the co-director of their Center for Social Media and Politics. So we're really lucky to have them here today discussing a pretty urgent topic um, from cutting-edge social science. So I hope you'll join us in, or join me in welcoming them. So much and thank you for hosting us today. We're just so honored to be here and really appreciate the invitation and a chance to share a little bit of the research that we've been doing as part of the Facebook and Instagram US 2020 presidential election. Uh, can people hear me okay in the back and online? Are we all good? A little bit higher. Louder, louder? Okay. Better? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, well, let's go ahead and get started by acknowledging that Josh and I are two representatives of a huge team of people. Research like this takes a lot of different people. And so we just wanted to, at the outset, acknowledge all of the collaborators and contributors to this work, uh, both at a variety of different academic institutions and within the core meta team. Um, what we'd like to do today is first talk about the collaboration with Meta, the decisions that we made there, and how we how we came to do this research. Then we'll tell you a little bit about the research design. We're going to focus on two parts of the results here. There are so many results across all of these that there, we definitely won't do justice to every part of these. But we're going to focus a bit today on the on-platform experiences on Facebook and Instagram. And then we'll hone in a bit on uh, polarization. And finally, we'll talk a bit about what we can and cannot conclude from this sort of research. Uh, so to begin, let's talk a little bit about collaborating with Meta. It's a very interesting position to be in, where the subject of study is also your collaborator. And so we wanted to really think through how we were going to engage in this research and really be thoughtful about that from the outset. A bit of background to begin with, the partnership with Meta began in early 2020. There was a core team of 17 researchers that collaborated to design the overall project. And we added additional academic team members to fill specific needs on uh, the various papers. Uh, we worked with NORC from the University of Chicago, um, and they partnered for gathering the data on the study. And the scope of this study, the study, the idea of the study from the outset, was that this would be examining the role and impact of Facebook and Instagram in the context of the US 2020 elections. Uh, if you're curious more about the process of how this came to be, we wrote out an FAQ. It's publicly posted. You can search for it there on Medium. And we just tried to really give the details about how this collaboration came to be and how we thought about it from the outset. So I encourage you to look there if you'd like more information. So when we approached this, um, we thought to ourselves, we really need to think about the integrity provisions that we put in place prior to initiating this sort of a collaboration and doing this sort of research. And the first thing that we did was we pre-registered the study designs. So this was including all of the research that we were planning to do on a date and time stamped, uh, stamped website prior to initiating it. These pre-registrations are also available after the studies are published and, of course, as part of the peer review process. And this was a way to ensure that at the outset we were specifying what we were going to do, that everyone was in agreement, that before we knew any results, this was the research that we were going to do and what we were going to present in the eventual papers. Uh, before we began the study, we were very adamant that we wanted to ensure that there was going to be no pre-publication approval. We didn't just want this to be a situation where a finding was potentially problematic for the company and they said they would have some right of refusal. That was not the case here. So, uh, Meta was able to check the uh, research that we were doing first for its privacy obligations to make sure we weren't violating any of those obligations for their legal obligations, and then also in terms of feasibility. So that if we came to them and said, let's do this billion dollar project, they of course have the ability to say, you know, I'm sorry, that's not feasible at this point in time. Uh, so those were some of the provisions that we put in place in terms of review. Uh, the way this was structured was that we had a variety of different pre-registrations that were put in place, and each one we specified academic lead authors. 
and these lead authors had control rights. So in the event of any disagreement about what would be included in the paper, whether it came from other academics on the team or whether it came from the meta collaborators, those academic core authors retained the final control rights and they had the final decision-making power to say this is what's included or excluded in the paper. Uh, we also uh, put into place a project rapporteur. Uh, so not only were we uh, studying all of these people and what was happening, but we were also being studied because this was um, Mike Wagner from the University of Wisconsin, and he was essentially an ethnographer throughout this project, determining how things went and observing the process. Uh, he also has published some of the results of his work alongside the uh, project results that we'll share with you today. Uh, we also have the data that are publicly available. So once the projects have been published, uh, the data are included on an archive at SOMAR at ICPSR. This is at the University of Michigan. And this is for researchers who are interested in replicating or extending any of the findings. So if you find any of the data here of interest, really encourage you to check out and apply. Uh, you do have to have uh, an IRB approval and those sorts of steps in place, but it's all there. So encourage you to take a look at that if there's um, additional research that you would like to do to extend what we're sharing uh, here today and in the papers. So the process by which the paper topics were chosen, we agreed at the outset that the overarching context here was Facebook and Instagram in the US 2020 election. And then we specified four key areas of interest that would govern the research project. And so the academic team identified political polarization as the first one, the second political participation, including vote choice and turnout. The third was disinformation, misinformation, information, knowledge and perception and misperception. So we kind of lumped all of those together. And then the fourth and final one was attitudes and beliefs about democratic norms. This included confidence in institutions as well. So with that broad framework, we then said about how are we going to uh, work as part of this collaboration in order to identify the research projects that we're going to conduct. And so we chose particular topics of study and then assembled research teams around these topics or around these ideas. Uh, we had some groups that were focused on experimental sorts of studies, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those in just a moment. We had some that were observational studies, so looking at what was actually happening on the platform. And then we had some that were a combination of both experimental and observational. And you'll get a flavor for all three of these as we talk through some of the results that we've been sharing so far. The first four papers were published this summer in Science and in Nature. I uh, really encourage you to take a look at the full papers. As I mentioned at the outset, we're only going to be able to kind of brush the surface of the findings here, but uh, they're robust supplemental appendices with lots of details there uh, that I encourage you to read. Okay, so what was the research design? Um, today what we're going to talk about is these first four studies, and first we have some observational studies that we'll share with you today. Uh, the first is some analysis looking at ideological segregation on Facebook. And we look at ideological segregation in two ways. The first is looking at a measure of segregation or how ideologically segregated the audience is with a maximum score here, meaning that conservatives are only looking at conservatives news and liberals are only looking at liberal news to the other end of the extreme, which would mean that liberals and conservatives are both looking at the same sorts of uh, outlets and URLs. And then favorability, which is looking at the political composition of who is looking at political news URLs on the platform. Zero being completely balanced, negative being liberal, and positive being conservative. And in this, um, in this paper, what we were able to look at is all political news URLs that circulated on the Facebook platform uh, and were shared by 100 or more, shared 100 or more times on the platform. So we'll tell you more about the results of that in just a little bit here. We also have an observational study where we were looking at like-minded exposure. And here we're looking at how often people were encountering like-minded sources. And I really want to emphasize the word sources here because we're not just looking at uh, content. So we're not looking at content that may express the same ideological view that one holds. We're looking at friends, uh, pages, and groups that share the ideological affiliation of the individual user. And so this doesn't only include political content. It includes any content that was posted by a like-minded user, a like-minded page, or a like-minded group. And the reason we did this was theoretical. Because it turns out that even non-political things can send very political cues. When you say, I'm going in my hybrid car to shop at Whole Foods, you <laughs> may not be intending to indicate your partisanship, but you may be sending that sort of a signal. So in this, in this um, study, what we're looking at is how often are people exposed to ideologically like-minded sources. 
The experimental treatments that we'll share today are threefold, and this was a really exciting opportunity to test some of these proposals that people have made about how the platforms might be changed, and there are really theoretical ideas undergirding what exactly is it that could be done on these platforms and what effect would it have. Uh, so the first uh, is altering the algorithm. And so in this study, we replaced the algorithmic feed, the ranking done by the internal ranking algorithm, in use at the time with a reverse chronological feed, where people then just saw the most recent content that was posted first and could scroll down and see things in the order in which they were posted based on the time ordering. The second one was to think about virality. And so first, altering the algorithm, second, thinking about virality. And here is where we blocked reshared content. So in people's feed, we altered the algorithm. So content that had been reshared wasn't included, uh, was demoted severely and blocked in most cases in the feed. And then the third and final one is where we were thinking about the idea of filter bubbles and echo chambers. And so here what we did is we experimentally reduced content from politically like-minded sources in people's feeds. So these are three alterations that we made to the content that people were seeing in their feeds, and we were able to evaluate then what the consequences were. In order to recruit people to participate in the experiment, we recruited people that were based in the US, that were age 18 and above, and monthly active users on the Facebook and Instagram platforms. Um, we recruited people in both English and Spanish, and participants gave their informed consent to participate in the experiment. So they were notified that it's possible that enrolling in part of this, that their feed would be altered in some way, although we did not specify precisely the way in which anyone's feed would be altered. Uh, they participated in the study for a period of three months, and approximately we have around 6,000 people per treatment, around 14,000 in the control. The data that we collected first, our primary data source was a panel survey that was conducted in between August and March surrounding the 2020 election, and this was the one in partnership with NRC. In addition, we appended all of the survey data with a log data that individuals consented to include from both their Facebook or from their Facebook and their or their Instagram experience. And so this included things like how much time they were spending on the platform and what they were engaging with. And then we had aggregated Facebook and Instagram log data. This was for the observational studies so that we could understand what was happening across all US users on the platform who are age 18 and above. Uh, we also have data on passive browser and app usage tracking. So for a subset of the participants, they agreed to allow us to track what they were doing on their, um, on their mobile devices and on their browsers so that we could then evaluate what was happening outside of the meta platforms that we were examining and look at um, how that changed as a consequence of the changes that we made to the algorithm. We also have data on public records, including voter files and FEC contributions. We won't be talking about that today. We also have Twitter usage data for people that agree to share their Twitter handle with us. And then we scrape data associated with that. OK, getting to the results, I'm going to start sharing a little bit with what we learned about how people's on-platform experiences were altered. And I'm going to focus predominantly here on the experiments that we did. So the first experiment that we did that I'm going to share some results for is when we changed what was happening with reshares. So this is when we're blocking reshares. This is when we're thinking about what is it if we change the nature of virality on the platform. And when we do this, you can just see by taking a quick glance through here, it's not as though what they saw in the feed changed dramatically if you compare the yellow bars to the blue bars. So it's not like they all saw political content before and no one saw political content afterward. But there were really important shifts that if you look at the relative difference in terms of percentage, it was pretty noteworthy how blocking reshares changed what people experienced on the platform. So when reshare content is blocked on Facebook, users see less political content. Um, they also see less content from cross-cutting and like-minded sources. So they're less likely to see content that was shared by cross-cutting sources and like-minded sources. And they, in fact, see slightly more content from either moderate or mixed sources. And what we mean by that is either the people that are going to those uh, sources, uh, like they're, they're part of a certain group or they're part of, they liked a certain page, that they don't have strong partisan identities. Or it means that the people that are going there are both from the left and the right, resulting in an average being right around the middle. So that sort of content is elevated when we block reshares. Uh, when we block reshares, people see less content from untrustworthy sources. 
and they see more uncivil content. So you get kind of an interesting mix here. The solution, of course, is, okay, if we just block reshares, maybe we dampen down virality, and then this will be something that will help people on the platform. But if we just look at the content that they see, we might say, okay, maybe it's a good thing that they, uh, that they um, saw less content from untrustworthy sources, but they also saw less political content, and they saw more uncivil content. So a takeaway from this and several of the other studies is the way in which these seemingly simple changes to the algorithm alter what people see. It's difficult to come down on the side that this is normatively good or this is normatively bad in terms of the consequence. Okay. Uh, for the um, experiment in which we change the algorithm from the standard algorithmic uh, prioritization of content to the chronological feed, we were able to look at both Facebook and Instagram, and this is instructive as well. So when we switch to a chronological feed, users see more political content. So that changes. We're only able to look at cross-cutting, like-minded, and moderate sources on Facebook. We don't have access to that data on Instagram because the platform doesn't have an ideological classifier in the same way for Instagram. But when we look at Facebook, we say less content from cross-cutting and like-minded sources and more content from moderate and mixed sources. We see more content from untrustworthy sources. And we see on Facebook less uncivil content and content with slow words. However, on Instagram, it's a bit different where we see a slight increase in uncivil content and content with slow words. So I think the takeaway from this again is that A, it's not a normatively clean story. So we might say, oh, that's great that people see more political content. Maybe they're going to be able to, to think more about politics. But they also see more content from untrustworthy sources. So it's a mixed bag here. And the solution of, oh, let's just remove the algorithm may have some things that we find normatively troubling. And the other takeaway is that these algorithms differ. Facebook and Instagram are different in terms of what they're privileging. Uh, we also see that when we alter the algorithm, it changes how people allocate their time. And the place we saw this most clearly is when we switched from the algorithmic prioritization of content that Facebook uses by default to this chronological feed. People spent a lot less time on Facebook and a lot less time on Instagram when we switched their feed to chronological as opposed to ranked using the standard ranking algorithm. And then there were substitution effects. So for the subset of people that allowed us to look at their browsing behavior, we could see did they change their habits in terms of accessing other sites. And what we see is that on mobile, those people who were switched to the chronological feed on Facebook increased their use of Instagram. And on their browser, they increased their use of YouTube and Reddit. When they switched to chronological feed for Instagram on mobile, they increased their use of YouTube and TikTok. So there is people alter their behavior on other sites when we change the algorithm on Facebook or on Instagram. <coughs> They also change how they engage with content. And so this um, that I'm going to show you here is from the like-minded study. When like-minded content is demoted, people engage less with content from like-minded sources and from misinfo repeat offenders. So the first one kind of makes sense, right? If you're seeing less like-minded content, you would anticipate that there's less engagement with like-minded content. The interesting part, though, is that when people see content from like-minded sources, so provided that they see it, which they're much, much less likely to do when we demote like-minded content, but when they do see it, they're actually more likely to engage with it. So it's almost as though in this setting where people don't have as much like-minded content in their when they see it, they're especially likely to say, oh, I'm gonna click on that, I'm gonna like that. They have an elevated probability of doing so. Uh, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon if we think that algorithms are learning from people's behavior, seeing less like-minded content seems to motivate them to engage with it more. Okay, that's a broad brush on some of the platform experience results, and I'm going to turn it over to Josh now to share some about the plot, or about the polarization results. Great. Thanks, Talia. And thanks, everybody, so much. I want to echo Talia in inviting us to be here today. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to present these results at Berkman Klein, which has made such an impact overall over the years about what the rest of us know about the internet and society. And so it's been, it's, it's a really honor to be here today. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, I'm going to take over and talk about polarization. And the reason I'm going to focus on polarization is that, as Talia said, there is, okay, as Talia said, there is, uh, 
there's a ton in these papers. Like, and these are the kind of papers that have like eight page papers and then 200 page supplemental appendices. So you should really dig in. And if there are particular questions you're working on, like take a look at them to see there may be data that's in there. And there's many more papers that are coming from the project that are gonna have in particular, some of them will have a lot more observational data that we hope will be helpful for everyone's research. But when I first got asked to give a talk about what we had learned so far across the four papers, I thought I would focus on polarization because polarization is something that cuts across all of these particular papers. And so this is, I think we can, we learn a lot from looking across, more than we look at any of the individual papers from looking across the, across the different papers. So let me remind you again, I'm gonna show you things about polarization now that come from both the observational studies as well as the experimental studies. Um, and so let's begin with the observational studies. And just to reiterate, remind you again what Talia told you that we did in these observational studies. We have two different ways we can look at polarization in the observational studies. We can look at ideological segregation and exposure to news. So that is for news sources on the platform, there's links to news on the platform. Are they primarily seen by Republicans, primarily seen by Democrats, or are they seen by a mix, or primarily seen by liberals, conservatives, or a mix? And then to exposure from politically like-minded sources. So here's what we find. This chart gives a very condensed uh, uh, thing about what we have learned over time. We learned over time about how much people are exposed, how much segregation there is in exposure to news on Facebook. And the key benchmark here to know is that there have been a button, and Ty told you about this, uh, this statistic here we're using. Zero would mean it's seen equally by liberals and conservatives, one would mean it's seen entirely by liberals or entirely by a negative one or entirely by conservatives. So this is a measure of how segregated the audience is. This isn't telling you what direction it's segregated, but just how segregated it is. The key benchmark to know here is that prior to this particular, uh, prior to us running this study on uh, Facebook, sorry, I'm just gonna set a timer so I know what I'm talking for. Um, prior to us running this particular study on Facebook, people had done some studies of this on browsers. So looking at what people left to their own devices, what kind of segregation did that lead to? And the benchmark for the browsers was about 0.10. So it, there was some segregation in people's news consumption habits. But when we look at the audiences on Facebook and Instagram, it's much higher than that, right? So here, the yellow line here is looking at, at the domain level, and the blue line here is looking at the individual story level. So the takeaway from this is that there are pretty high levels of segregation in regard to news exposure on Facebook. Um, oops, sorry. Moreover, we have the ability to look at this segregation at different levels. And you can think about this. So if you think about people's exposure to news on the Facebook platform, there's kind of a, a number of different ways that you could think about the level of segregation. The first is what we call the potential audience, right? So the potential audience for the news is everyone for whom that news could have appeared in their feed. And so where would that be? Well, so if I'm on Facebook, I can get things into my feed from what my friends post, what pages I follow post, and what groups I follow post. So we can think about this as kind of like a decision of the individual. The individual decides who they're gonna, they're gonna follow, and that creates a level of segregation. And that's our lowest level of segregation when we look at domains, and it's about the lowest level of segregation when we look at the, when we look at the URLs. Then we think of the next step, which is what am I actually exposed to? That's the algorithm, right? Like that is clearly algorithmic decision because you have all this potential content, but at the next step, it's, well, what does the platform choose to show you? And we see that at the, at the domain level, that goes up. There's higher levels of segregation once the algorithm gets involved. Interestingly, at the, UR level, at the URL level, there's actually no difference there. It's about basically the same. And then there's engagement. Well, this is clearly the human part of the behavior. It shows up on my screen. What am I going to engage with? So what am I going to click on? What am I going to like? What am I going to do something? And in both of these cases, there's another big jump when we look at engagement. So the highest levels of segregation that we find are in terms of what people are choosing to engage with when they get there. So the, in terms of who likes a story, who reacts to a story, that's even more segregated than who's shown a story. And that's across the URLs are all the domains. Um, so what we see here is that when we think about this question of segregation, it is a complex interaction of algorithmic components from the platform, right, which is definitely happening when we go from here to here, 
human components, which is definitely happening when we go from here. And then there's this first step, which is which I described as, well, that's kind of a human component in terms of who you choose to make your networks with. But of course, we know these platforms also suggest who should be in your networks. So this first level is actually a, is actually a component of both algorithms and human choice. So this segregation is so two takeaways. Segregation is there. Second, it comes from this kind of complex intersection of algorithmic uh, effects and human choice. The next big thing we learned from this is that it's actually asymmetrical. So it turns out there's lots of segregation out there. And there's segregation on the left. There's plenty of stuff that's seen primarily by the left. And there's stuff that's primarily seen by the right. But it's not symmetrical. It actually turns out, and this is especially clear when you look at the URLs, that there is just a corner of the Facebook ecosystem where things are seen only, where news is seen entirely or almost entirely by people on the right. And there's something like that on the left, but it's much, much smaller. So you see the sort of, when we get into like 95% of, of content only coming from the left, it's almost dropped off to a small part. On the right, this goes up much, much higher, which you know has some, has some overlaps with work that's been done at Berkman Klein uh, in the past looking at the television uh, ecosystem. All right, but we also have really interesting data from the like-minded sources paper at the observation. Yeah. Just a clarification. Yeah, clarification. Uh, how do you, how was uh, news content defined? How is news content defined in terms of being uh, whether or not the news content is on the left or the right? Uh, yes. I this is all, okay. So this. Oh, how is like, news? Also, like, what is is this news or not? News? What is news? Yeah. So we had a cl there's a classifier for what was civic news. It was like a classically, you know, like trained machine learning algorithm. This is all about audience determination. So everything I'm telling you. So thanks for clarifying this. Everything I'm telling you here in these in this study in the Gonzalez and Bion study um, is all about. Uh, audience determination. So this is, we have estimates of people's, people whose ideology were able to estimate on the platform. We aggregate up to all the people who saw, interacted with, were engaged to, these kinds of things. All right. So now, the second place that we have observational data has to do with the like-minded sources paper. This is the Nyhan et al. paper. And in the like-minded sources paper, we're able to look at uh, how much content in people's feeds comes from people who, from sources that are politically like-minded. So if I'm conservative, how much am I seeing from conservative sources? Cross-cutting, if I'm conservative, how much am I seeing from liberal sources? Or moderate, mixed, if I'm, you know, how much am I seeing from mixed sources, regardless of whether I'm conservative or liberal. All right, so that's the setup here. These are cumulative distribution functions, which are kind of interesting. I'm gonna kind of give you on the slide the sort of takeaway from this, which is that, and here's the sort of main headline feature here which is that for the median Facebook user, right? Like, so that's the person who's you know, right here on this study, on the 50th percentile. For our median Facebook user, they're seeing a majority of their content from politically like-minded sources. So just over 50% of the content. That's in contrast to the median Facebook user is seeing about 15% of the content that they see on Facebook from cross-cutting sources. But it's important to remember, so Talia was talking about earlier about how we made this decision to look at all content and breaking it down based on the political congruence with the source of the content. When we actually run classifiers over how much of this is actually political information or political news, it's actually a small portion of it, of le slightly less than 7% in each cases. So most of what you're seeing isn't political content or political news, but it's still coming from politically like-minded sources. So that gets into, if you've read Jamie Settle's book, right, Friend of Me, is like this whole concept of like how much of the, I'm driving my, you know, I'm driving my electric vehicle to the food market, you know, how many other subtle cues are we getting in there? What is interesting though, is that extreme echo chambers don't seem that prevalent. So only about a fifth of the sample is getting 75% or more from politically like-minded sources. So four fifths of people on Facebook are seeing at least a quarter of their content are coming from non-politically like-minded sources. But that being said, getting a lot of content from cross-cutting political sources is also pretty rare. So only about uh, a third of people get at least 25% of their content from cross-cutting sources. And as I said, the median person only gets 15%. All right, so when we look at the observ observational evidence on polarization, Facebook definitely shows signs of echo chambers and political segregation. And I've been involved with a bunch of empirical papers that have pushed back on the overwhelming kind of echo chamber narrative that's out there that's shown that these social media platforms are actually a bit less of an echo chamber than people originally thought. 
I will say, me personally working on this project, based on this observational data, I updated my prior a bit in terms of how ideologically segregated I think Facebook is. Um, a lot of news is primarily seen by those on the left or the right, but not both, and this is especially so for news seen by the right. Uh, news segregation is higher on Facebook than in previous studies of web browsing, and it's much higher from groups and pages. I didn't, we didn't show those results, those are in the paper here. Um, similarly, people are exposed to much more content from politically like-minded sources, and there's this complex relationship that seems to be driving that between algorithms and human choice. All right, now what about the experiments? Here's the big punchline, right? So we had these three experiments getting at these three big fundamental concepts, I don't have to tell you this at Berkman Klein, in the study of internet. Morality, engagement maximizing algorithms, and echo chambers, right? Like these are big things that we look at and think about having, you know, we as scientists are really interested in the causal impact. We think these are fundamental features of social media and what's different about social media. The ability of information to go viral, people being able to self-select into echo chambers, and these engagement maximizing algorithms. And we were able to really precisely manipulate features of the platform that are tied to each of those things. Talia went through all of these with you. Reshares, replacing the algorithm with chronological feed, and depressing the amount of content that people get from like-minded sources. And the findings were, contrary to what we expected to find, there was no impact of any of these experiences on affective polarization. Those of you who are like political scientists use this term for how much you dislike the other party or ideological polarization, exactly even how, how polarized you are on issues. In neither case do we find this. I'll just whirl you through where we can find these things. But like, this is the algorithm to reverse chronological feed. And remember, this was being proposed as a policy adaptation, right, to deal with polarization. No impact on Facebook or Instagram. And we have, these are really big experiments. We had, you know, 23,000 people in it. We were precisely powered to be able to detect nulls of less than 0.03 standard deviation. So this is much higher than any other story. So when we say there were no effects, these are really precisely powered to be able to reject the opportunity that there was an effect here. <laughs> this is what we ended up finding with the reshares when we look at affective polarization and issue polarization. Again, no effect. This is what we found in the like-minded paper. Again, affective polarization or having extreme ideological views. No impact on it. Okay, so what can and can't we conclude from these studies? Um, all right, so there's a ton of caveats I want to give here, right? Like, we did these studies for only, we can say only three months. Now, as a political scientist, like most of what we know, a lot of what we know about political behavior and the causal impacts of political behavior was based on getting University of Michigan undergraduates in a lab for you know an hour and a half. So three months is long or it's short, depending on your on your interest. We thought three months was a really long time. But of course, you know, maybe this is a big thing if it's if it's maybe we find different effects if we were taking people off the, you know, changing these things for two years. We only did it in one country. And the United States has a weird political system compared to the rest of the world. So we don't know how this would play out in multi-party systems or single party authoritarian regimes. Uh, this was during a period of heavy political exposure, right? And so, and there was a reason it was during a period of heavy political exposure. The entire purpose of this study was that we walked out of 2016 when the country kind of collectively lost its mind about the impact of social media on politics with so many unanswered questions. And part of our motivation for doing this study was we wanted to make sure that policymakers, scholars, the press, the community, the public, would have more information about what actually happened on social media in the context of 2020 than we did in 2016. But this means that these results I'm showing you, this is a time when people are getting political information on TV, they're getting it on the radio, they're getting it from their neighbors, they're much more likely to be talking about politics in the hallway than they are other periods of time. So we can ask the question of, well, what if we did the same study not in the middle of a campaign season? Might it have had a difference? Um, you know, when we think about these kinds of experiments, we have to like, think, you know, we, if I was in the treatment group, I wouldn't have seen reshared content. But Talia might be my friend in real life, and she might still be seeing reshared content. And so we didn't shut off reshared content for everybody, right? And there were ethical reasons why you don't change, you know, for 99% of the platform and leave a 1% holdout, uh, which is a different way you could have designed these kinds of studies. But maybe that would be different if we did this. Again, we, we privileged scientific inquiry in these studies. That was the point of this. And we were, this was an opportunity we had never before had as, as external scholars to look at particular aspects of the platform experience because we did change those particular aspects of the platform experience. Um, so we did one at a time in each study because we wanted to get, we wanted to look at virality. We wanted to look at echo chambers. But 
Maybe we would have seen something different if we changed all of them, as opposed to only changing one of them. Um, and then, uh, if you guys can make this go away, my last point, <laughs> um, uh, it was only one platform, right? And people live on lots of platforms, right? So, and even the studies that we did on Facebook and Instagram, those were separate studies. We, for, for, again, to be precise about what we were studying, we didn't enroll people in both the Facebook and Instagram study. But it's possible if you change the way people were exposed to content on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Twitter, you might see something different. All right, so what can we conclude? We can conclude that algorithmic changes affect platform experiences. That's what Talia has talked to you, uh, talked to you a ton about this. Um, we can conclude that Facebook has a good deal of ideological segregation. As I said a moment ago, a lot of news consumed by liberals or conservatives, and this is driven more by pages and group than users, and people are getting much more content from ideologically like-minded sources on these platforms than they are from cross-cutting sources. This, to me, all seems incontroversial. What we also can conclude is that we have not found simple answers for complex problems. We would love to have been able to come to you here today at Harvard Law School and say, look, get them to turn off reshares before every election and it will make people hate each other less. Like, that would have been great. It would have been a really good outcome. We would have had a clear policy of subscription. But what we found is we, and we think we went after here, like the big things that people are speculating, writing about in the literature, that people are speculating about in the press, that policymakers talk about, that people testify before Congress about, virality, intention management algorithms, you know, um, echo chambers, right? We went after the big ones, and boom, and none of them seemed to give us confidence that if we just change this for a couple months before an election, it would have a different impact. Um, and I think for, you know, for my faith, I come from a background, and I'm a political scientist who's been studying political behavior for my whole career, um, which started like right over there, um, and, uh, in grad school, and, uh, you know, I was, in, and, you know, and I think some of this part to me is like, there's a little bit of like revenge of political behaviorists here, because political behaviorists will tell you it's really hard to shift things, ingrained attitudes like affective polarization. Right? And there's been a lot of stuff that's come out of the internet research thing that says, man, this new thing in the internet, it's having this huge impact on things and we should just change it and things would be fixed, right? Like polarization is obviously coming from a lot of different angles in society. And again, it would have been great if we could come to you here with a solution and there's still projects ongoing and maybe some of the projects ongoing will allow us to do this, but it may just be a reflection of the fact that like, there are big societal factors that have gotten us to this point in this country, and I can speculate on what those are from my political science hat, that have led to these high levels of polarization that we see in the United States, that we see in Europe, that we see in India, that we see in lots of places. There are big global phenomena collecting this, and simply changing one aspect of people's experience on one platform is not going to be enough to sort of deal with these kind of problems. Um, all right, what can we cannot, not conclude? And this I want to be really, really, really clear about to end on this. <laughs> this is, the question that everyone wants answered is, is it social media's fault that we're living in a polarized world? That's a different question from, if we change aspects of social media, can we make things better? We can't answer that question. Nothing in these studies should be interpreted to say if, the, if there hadn't been advances in computing power 15, 20 years ago that allowed these social media platforms to come about, if they hadn't, you know, if Mark Zuckerberg hadn't, you know, met somebody in a dorm over there and this, that, and the other thing, we still know the answer to those questions. Like, if the world had, had been, you know, had done this differently, it's the wrong counterfactual. We can't rerun the last 15 years. And any study we run now will be run against the background of a world that has had social media for 15 years. By the way, this, I think these are, this is a very important point about AI as well. We start to think about the impact of AI on society and we start measuring these things. So consequently, we cannot conclude from these experience, these experiments that social media has or has not had an impact on the growth in political polarization that we have seen globally and that we've seen in this country over the last 10 to 15 years. And to claim on the basis of these experiments that that's the case is claiming too much from the basis of these experiments. And unfortunately, though, the null results don't allow us to pinpoint a particular feature of social media as a potential candidate for exacerbating polarization independent of the larger information environment. So thank you so much for your time. We're super excited to answer any questions and discuss and, uh, and hope this has all been informative. And thanks for all you guys do here at Berkman Klein. So thanks so much.
Awesome. I'm going to selfishly offer the first question. Um, one of the observations that the project rapporteur noted in his piece in science is that from, from his perspective, the Meta's data architecture is so massive and complex and that as an outsider coming in, it can be hard to know just the universe of observations and, and things you could get your hands on. So I guess if, it would be awesome if you could speak to that and how that shaped the questions you were, you were trying to tackle, the designs that you were coming up with, and then also taking a step back um, looking at things like PADA or other transparency proposals that are out there, uh, do you think those have enough teeth to ameliorate that sort of concern? And coming out of the project, what sort of uh, provisions are really necessary to make sure that independent outside researchers are able to tackle the questions in an informed way? You want to take the first part of the uh, Sure, have to. Uh, it absolutely is the case that uh, being an outsider coming in to Meta, there is all sorts of things about the infrastructure of the data and what's stored and what isn't, what the retention policies are and how things are operationalized that you don't know. And so there most certainly was a learning curve and a, a lot of back and forth where we would say, we want, we're thinking about this. And they would say, okay, well, we have it in this way. And, oh, okay, that's, so I think that there, that's, an important thing to take into account is, you know, these are infrastructures that have built up over a decade, right? And data infrastructures that have been developed and the way in which the code is stored and how the tables are populated and lots of bureaucracy in terms of what, what, is, what is captured and what is not captured, what is retained and what isn't. Uh, so I think that that's an, a really valuable lesson actually for anyone that's thinking about doing this sort of platform research is how complex the data structures are. I mean, just imagine how many people are on there and how many things can be recorded in any given minute. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just say very briefly about the second part of your question and then pass to you, Josh, is I, I think that this makes clear that we need to have some infrastructure in place to make it possible for those people who are outside of companies to evaluate what's happening on them. But I think it also makes clear that you have to have some level of expertise on what's happening on the platform in order to do that because there are all sorts of parts to the infrastructure that you wouldn't know if you didn't have some of that uh, background. Yeah, I just want to add on that second point. This is something that I feel passionate about and have written about a lot. Like, um, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, does PADA have enough teeth? PADA hasn't been passed yet, right? Like, so like, <laughs> I would, let's start with PADA, right? Like, and get that passed. Um, but DSA is super exciting. The fact that these are these are kind of models, you know, like we're really hopeful that maybe the platforms will respond to DSA by saying, well, if we have to make this data available in Europe, we're going to build APIs that make it available more generally. Um, you know, the it, it is you know absolutely clear that we live in a world right now where if you want to understand social media's impact on politics or on society or any of these things, that no matter where we go, we're kind of at the whim of the platform. Right, like, and Nate personally and I, in the conclusion of our book, Social Media and Democracy in the State of the Field, like, in our concluding chapter, we wrote, like, look, you basically have four options as a researcher, right? Like, one is, one is you work around the platforms and you don't collaborate with them and you try to get the data any way you can, and that has pros and cons. And we go through, you know, we list them, and I have to talk lots of them. One is you collaborate with the platforms and you can. That has pros and definitely has cons, right? Like, one is you lobby, or not lobby, you speak to, you inform public policy <laughs> about the importance of things like PADA and the importance of having data access, you know, for researchers. And the third, or the fourth is that you just give up and say, we're not going to try to go with these questions. And if we think the questions are so important that we don't do that, we're, you know, we're left with the other three. I got to say, when we wrote the book, the one that looked like the long shot was like getting governments to get involved in regulation and making data available. The, the climate around that has really improved in the last few years. Uh, and, you know, and no thanks to work that people are doing here at um, Gorkman Klein and HLS, but like that's gotten a lot better, I think. But, but to, to your teeth question, right? Like I think one of the things that have come out of this project is that it's possible like you may disagree with particular ways on ways that we did things. There might be, we have ways that if we were doing this over from scratch that we think we could improve this. But the big picture is it is possible to do a thing like this where you are able to run causal studies on super important issues, right? That can only be done by changing things about the platform experience itself. 
to gather observational data to be able to see at the scale of the platform what is happening and to get this data out there. Um, and you know, my thought is is that I hope is is that this this project will have two impacts, right? One is the direct impact. Everything that's in the papers, we now know, we already know way more about 2020 than we did know about uh, 2016. And the fact that this data is available for replication, when people get in there, people are going to dive in and get more stuff as people look at the appendix. We have more papers coming from this project. That's the direct impact. The indirect impact is the model now exists. And and so your question of does it have enough teeth, I've heard people who are saying, who are you know super enthusiastic about DSA in Europe, responding to these studies when they came out and saying, wow, even with DSA, there's nothing in DSA to compel the platforms to allow people to run these types of experiments. And I think the model to think about is stress testing banks. Like in this country, we have no, I mean, I'm at Harvard Law School, so I'm, there are people who know a bazillion times more than I do. But we have setups where people are, you know, where it said, this is so important, the bank is so important for society that they have to submit themselves to these kinds of tests on a regular basis so we know what the impact of X and Y is on the banking system. Why are we not saying that about, you know, about the information environment system? And so my hope is that the secondary impact of this study is that it's now a model. And people can look at this. And if you're sitting in Indonesia and you want to know what the impact of Facebook is on Indonesian elections, maybe why are you sitting there and saying, hey, we should get to do this too. Like, why is this only being done in the US? So, so many viewers and listeners online trickling in with questions. I'm going to try to summarize the question of Rennie and Jonathan, which is somewhat connected and has to do with this issue of pre-hardened politics uh, arriving at polarization. So Rennie is asking, are you saying that rather than algo manipulation has negli neg negligible effective impact, it's possible for people uh, arrived in the political season with pre hardener positions and therefore less likely to be affected by manipulation or variables in those hardener positions may, may have been facilitated and exacerbated by the social. And then uh, Jonathan's asking the polarization, uh, specific questions about the polarization study. One is in finding limited impact on polarization, how did you control for the amount of prior exposure to polarized content which might have caused someone to harden their beliefs already? And two, in saying only 20% of people got 75% plus of content from like-minded sources, did you look at people's propensity to vote or actual voting? Because only a subset of people vote, even a small percentage of echo chamber, people could have been disproportional electoral effect. Um, so try, I'll, let me try to answer this really quickly. So on the first question, yeah, the, the, that's the answer is yes. Like we, that absolutely, thanks for the questions. Um, you know, that's what I was trying to say at the end. Like what we have learned is that changing these features of the platform experience for three months around the 2020 election did not have a noticeable impact on polarization, full stop. Could that be because people arrived at this point with very hardened polarized attitudes? Yeah, everything about me is a, political behavior person thinks, yeah, polarization is pretty, these are pretty hard in attitudes most of the time. They're hard to change any time. Could that be because of the last 15 years of being exposed to social media? Sure, but I don't know. It could also be about the Great Recession and the aftermath of the Great Recession. It could be about political elites in this country and the type of rhetoric they're using. Like, there's a lot of things that could be causing it. I don't, from this study, I don't know the answer to that. On the, um, on the how do we explore, explore, for, expose, uh, explore for prior exposure, to content, so there's two answers to that. One is, that's the beauty of experiments. When you randomly assign people to treatment and control, as long as your randomization process works, you should have that in both the treatment and control groups, and so the effect that you're trying to measure is independent of it. We also, however, register pre-registered a large number of heterogeneous treatment effects, which is what this is a class of, of questions for. Um, and in these, that's way too much for, because there's heterogeneous treatment effects across all the papers and everything. things. It's way too much for us to, to have got into in this kind of talk. I encourage people to see the appendices, to go look at the papers if there are specific heterogeneous treatment effects you're interested in. But yeah, the TLDR on this one is. Really quickly, because yeah. we did look at people's prior exposure to like-minded content, for example, as one of those heterogeneous treatment effects. And TLDR is. And TLDR is that we didn't really find any heterogeneous treatment effects. Like, we looked at tons of heterogeneous treatment effects and we found almost nothing. And so, you can go back and look in and see these particular ones. In this particular case, I think we definitely didn't find anything because it would have been it would have been something that was highlighted in the paper. But all that data is there. And if there are heterogeneous treatment effects we didn't test for, you can go 
And um, you can go and get the data yourself and test for these other types of heterogeneous treatment effects you want to test for um, in the case. And just adding that we did look at voting in some of these, and there were also no effects. So that's included in the papers. Do you guys just want to bunch your questions together? Sure. So thank you for being here. Um, I know you, you talked about the system design or just the um, platform itself, but what do you think, if anything, um, this study or these series of studies show in, um, for content creators in regards to trying to make engaging content? Feel free to just lump them together. And then... Okay. Um, it seems to me that there are two Facebook-related causal studies that precede you guys, one of which is Black Hat with Cambridge Analytica, and one of which is 15 years of A-B studies for stickiness and algorithm design internal to Facebook slash meta. Um, you guys are the white hats, you know, yay. Um, but did you get access to and compare the data on those two things? Did Facebook actually give you access to their AD uh, investigations as part of the study? My question is, at the very beginning, you said you were trying to study four things. You spent the rest of the time on polarization, so I don't remember what the other three were. Yeah. Did, you get non did you get any non-null results on any of the other three things that you were studying? Take those? Okay. Um, do we just start with all three and then you can yeah, add on? Yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you for those great questions. Um, the first in terms of info information for content creators, if you look inside of the studies when we remove reshares, for example, or when we switch to the chronological algorithm, you can see what sort of content is being algorithmically prioritized. So when you compare what sort of content is in the feed with chronological to what sort of content is in the feed with the engagement-based ranking. If you compare those two to each other, that's essentially telling you what the algorithm is prioritizing or deprioritizing. So if you're a content creator and you say, okay, I want my things to be prioritized algorithmically, then look at the sort of things that are being prioritized algorithmically. So that would be one tidbit there. Uh, we did not have internal data on Cambridge Analytica or other A-B studies that had been done in the past. Of course, you all know here that there's a, a trove of data here uh, released by the whistleblower, so there's some information there, but we did not have access to that. And then the third question about other effects. Um, in the reshares paper, when we blocked reshared content, what we found is for those people in the sample, they, were less, they had lower levels of news knowledge. So if you'll remember for reshares, uh, there was less political content in people's feed when we blocked it. And for the sample itself, we see a, an impact in terms of news knowledge afterward. There's some indication there that it might be there for factual discernment as well. But once we adjust for the number of tests that we did, that effect is no longer significant. So there are hints of it there, and both of those things point in the same direction. Then I think there's 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 something going on there in terms of what people know. And the other two things you were studying, you got no results also. Uh, in that is correct in the study. We didn't in, we didn't look at all outcome variables across all studies. So just with a caveat there that there's more to be done there, and it's not a perfect match. Um, but across the board, mainly no results. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations for this study. My name is Dimitri Nesevova and I'm a professor uh, in communic communication theory at the Complutense University of Madrid. So first of all, I want to invite you, recommend you to repeat this study. As you said, maybe in a multi-party countries or one-party countries. And also I would have like to recommend you to do this in Spain because Spain is now a very interesting uh, experimental field. We have a parliament with more than 10 parties. So my questions, uh, how do you imagine would be the methodology in a uh, multiplier, um, multi-party, sorry, um, uh, country, like the case of Spain, more than 10 parties in the parliament, 
Um, I imagine that one of the, uh, the, the difficulties we, uh, ha has to do with uh, ideology because it will be not the same. There will be cross-cutting topics uh, uh, between some of the parties. So the question is, how do you imagine it will be? Can we restart? Thank you very much. Yeah, without going into a massive divergence in how we measure partisanship in, in multi-party systems, which I would be happy to talk about for a long time, I would recommend that you take a look at the comparative study of electoral systems, which is a cross-national um, collaborative election study project that piggybacks, that puts common content and piggybacks on the, con on the back of individual national election studies. I mean, I think things like affective polarization, to the extent that we measure those with feeling thermometers, you can measure that with lots of different parties. The question of how you measure ideological polarization in multi-party systems is much more complicated, how you measure it at the systemic level. But you can look at things like whether people who are exposed to you know, different types of feed treatments or something like that have more extreme positions on issues. That would be one way of doing it. It doesn't, it doesn't translate one-to-one -to, -one to like what that means to the overall system level of part of polarization, but it could get you an insight into that. Um, One more listener, viewer, tuning online with the question, and this time is Matt uh, Macahon. Mac uh, there was one slide that you showed diversity of content on the left and the right, and the far side of the right soup were up way more drastically than the left. Does this mean that the extreme right opinions or content are much further from zero than far left opinions and content? No. Oh, you want to go back there? I was going to say, no, 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 what that, just to be really clear about that, and, and it, I think the important thing to wrap your head around in the Gonzalez and Bion paper is that the unit of analysis is the article, the news article. So it's not, the unit of analysis is not individuals, individual people, and what we're looking at is the audience composition. So the maximum you can get is 100% audience composition, you know, the composition is all liberals and no, conserv and no, conserv and no uh, li conservatives or all conservatives and no liberals. So what that figure showed, which is essentially a distribution of how that's distributed across the entire space going from, um, you know, 100% liberal and zero conservative to 100% conservative and zero liberal, it's spread out over the space. So there's plenty of content that is on both sides, but that peak at the right side, which is not mirrored on the left side, means there is this, there is this bunch of content. And again, we're saying nothing about what's in that content. This is just the audience composition. So what it means is there are a bunch of URLs on Facebook that get seen only by conservatives. And that, that's a, there's a, you know, a chunk of things that kind of fall into that area. And we don't see that on you know, that, that, that curve could have looked like this, right? It kind of looks, instead, it kind of looks like this, right? And so you get across the distribution. So there's some content that's seen, there's some news content that's seen by both liberals and conservatives, but it could also look like this, right? If it was really that most news was being seen, you know, was who was seeing news with orthogonal to partisanship, then you would expect it to all be bunched in the middle. And that's clearly not what we found. Um, just wanted to follow up on the content creator question. And for transparency, I used to be on the civic team at Facebook, so we work with some folks I know very well. Um, one, uh, I actually do think there are some opportunities on the production side to test some things out, especially on reshares. So, for example, like what if there was an interstitial that popped up when you were about to reshare content that came up in the civic classifier that sort of just like gave you some like words to the lies, like hey, make sure like this content is X, Y, Z before posting, etc. Like I'd be really curious about the consumption effects then of, uh, you know, content that's been produced in a more thoughtful way um, and like comparing those different A-B groups. Yeah, love that comment. And uh, I don't think anything we're suggesting precludes any of that and more innovation in terms of how these platforms are structured. So uh, another hat I wear is working with New Public and they're trying to think through how is it that we would design social spaces in more public friendly ways that allow people to uh, work productively together, for example. So I, I don't think any of this precludes new innovation in terms of thinking through how platforms should be designed, but I think that it does say that the effects of some of these things that have been proposed as ways to reduce affective polarization, for example, uh, they don't seem to have that effect, at least under the confines of the study that we did here. And I, I would just add two things. One, 
If you look at the research on misinformation, there's been a ton of work on various interventions, including there's like a whole subfield that's called nudges. <laughs> um, and then there's also a, a friction subfield, which interestingly enough, if you look at Molly Roberts' work on censorship in China, like that's basically what the Chinese government does is try to is uses friction right. for a ton of its censorship. So I think there's lots of good examples to look at in that particular regard. People have focused on misinformation, but you could focus it on other things and you could focus it on you know higher quality content and those kind of things. And just one quick caveat on Talia's point answer to you, like if I was a content creator right now, like I think I'd be interested in looking at what was more likely to be reshared and what was prioritized by the algorithm for this study, but I would do it with the caveat that this is data from 2020, and these things are very live, living, breathing organisms. Uh, oh, well, that's a bad, they're not organisms, but they're changing all the time. They're complex, like this was going back to the first question. There's complex interactions of lots of different features, and I would not for any way, shape, assume that if you could tease out from something we found in 2020 that it would still be in place today. It might be, I just would go into it with like, you know, cautious eyes, which again, going back to the first question, I think points to the importance of Hopefully this kind of study is not a one-shot deal, that it becomes something that's repeated over time and repeated in different contexts in multi in multi-party systems and we get, you know, we're able to design more studies that are able to be implemented in these ways. Awesome. We're a little past one, but if you guys are willing just to take the last couple of questions in the room, awesome. Uh, both of you have been mentioning only about left and right, liberal and conservative. How about so-called moderate? Like I myself consider to be a moderate. And I just, at the time of election, I vote depending upon what the candidate stands for. It's not the left and right. And it, even it, it happened in Massachusetts. You know, Massachusetts, we had a Republican governor and even it voted for President Reagan uh, in 1984. So, and again, conservatives, there can be quite religious people who are good-minded, respectful, respectful to others. Then there may be people who are hating others. Still, still, they're all club and medidas conservatives. And liberals can be with all good ethics and then with all ultra, so-called, I mean, in my opinion, unwanted ethical aspects. So, merging everyone as liberal or conservative. So, to me, it is somewhat not very informative, I mean, just for my understanding. And again, when you ask your users how, how far they were very true to their conscience, I mean, displaying their privacy, they might have altered their behavior just for your study. Is, is there a possibility someone altering their behavior just for your study? Um, great questions. Uh, happy to maybe start with the first part of it and jump into the second part as well. Uh, so the first part of the question is about what about moderates? And across uh, these studies, we do look at moderates as well. So in several of the studies, we look at those people that have uh, views, you know, 0.65 and above, 0.35 and below, and consider those in the middle to be moderates. Uh, in our like-minded study, we did do it so that we split people right at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, but we did do some robustness checks to ensure that, res that the results would hold if we also allowed for some moderate in the middle. Um, so I think it's a really good point. I think there is a moderate component to this, and as you saw in some of the work where we were looking at what sort of sources did people see in their feed, it did change the percentage of sources that people were seeing from moderate or mixed ideological sources. So I think you're definitely onto something. And also just to acknowledge your broader point, I think, which is are there more axes than the left-right axes even with the middle? Uh, yes, absolutely there are. And we just focused on that one in this study. But there are more complex ways um, to look at this beyond, beyond thinking about that. Um, and then I think the, the second part of your question is uh, asking whether people would have altered their behavior as a consequence of being part of this study. Uh, you know, for those people that uh, were informed about the possibility of the study, might they have decided to change things? You know, I think there's a possibility. I, I can't quantify it for you necessarily, but I will say this took place over a three-month time period. Uh, we can look at how people behaved in a control group versus a treatment group where we were altering things, and we do see uh, differences in their behavior. So if 
you know, maybe they both altered in some way, but we still see differences between treatment and control, and we would expect that to be randomized across the two. Um, and, you know, these, were, these are more subtle changes, right? I think it would be hard for a person to all of a sudden, like, oh, they removed reshares. I just think that would be exceptionally difficult for someone to have really thought through and come to that conclusion in a way that they would either hypothesis guess or act against the hypothesis. Um, but you may want to add more. Is there one last question? Or? If there's time. Very brief. <laughs> Very briefly, the, the so the only non-null that popped off the slides and then that you alluded to in the Q&A is the decreased engagement with political news uh, under one of the conditions and then decreases in news knowledge. Was there any sense that there was a concomitant decrease in the intensity or salience of sort of politicization among those people, even if there was no movement in beliefs or affective polarization? Yeah, I mean, that's a... That's the reshare study, right? And so that's the one that did have this interesting finding where it, it made, it, you know, what we discovered from the first part that Talia was showing you is that people were getting less news and then not surprisingly, they knew less about the news, right? And this is pretty consistent across, there's been, my lab has done a couple of different Facebook deactivation studies, one in uh, Bosnia, one in Cyprus, right? Oh, thanks, thanks. And, um, and in those papers, and then in the All Cotton Genska that did in the U.S., it's pretty consistent across those studies. This has nothing to do with this study, but that like, when you take people off Facebook, they're a little happier, but they know a little bit less about what's going on, <laughs> right? Like those are, those are three studies that all find those kind of findings. Um, uh, and, uh, and so it's not, a, you know, so, so what we learned was that, what we may have learned is a little bit of the mechanism, but like we've learned that reshares play a role, which kind of makes sense, right? If you think that like, Lots, there are some people who are more, you know, we all kind of know these, I and mean, this is going to be a little anecdotal, but like we know people who are, who go online and like to share news a lot, right? Like that's kind of the model of Twitter. And so if you get people away from the things that people are resharing, maybe you're getting more original content. And so it, I think we've learned something about that, that part of the news ecosystem comes from sharing links as opposed to everyone posting them organically. Um, did we check, I mean, what we were, you know, the place we were checking the intensity was on the affective polarization. That was like, would you have lower levels of affective polarization? I mean, that was the one, you know, that was the one thing that we, that, you know, that we went in there expecting to find from everything that ever heard about it. So it was surprising to us as these results came in too. And just adding that there is a finding or two uh, with respect to partisan news clicks that kind of relates to all of this as well, uh, that you can find in the papers, but, uh, yeah, we didn't have a specific measure of salience in some most important problem way or something like that. All right, well, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Talia. I know there's more papers coming out, so hopefully we'll have you back in a few months for an update, perhaps. But uh, thanks, everyone, joining online and in person today for the awesome questions. And hope to see you next week for our last installment with Ethan Zuckerman. But thanks again to Josh and Talia for today. Great. Thank you so much.